questions for about 15 minutes, and then we will adjourn. Welcome. All right, thank you very much. I was actually born in the Midwest, but they don't talk. They don't all talk the way I do. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about, about consciousness, which usually scientists don't do, or they don't do until they, until they retire. <laughs> um, but that's a really a shocking omission, since consciousness is the only, if you think about it, consciousness is the only way we know about the world. So the fact that, that, that I know anything about the fact even that I exist, you know, even if I wake up in the middle of the night in a dark hotel room, I don't know where I am, I don't know, know quite what I'm doing here, but I have already some feelings. And a minute before, when I was in deep sleep, presumably I didn't have any feelings. And this is what, this is sort of the heart of the ancient mind-body problem, consciousness, experience, phenomenology. What does it feel like something? Those are just different names. This is a, a beautiful painting. It's in the um, it's in one of the rooms, the private chambers of the of the Pope in um, in um, in Rome by Rubens, and it illustrates. It's called the School of Athens. Um, it uh, illustrates the various philosophers and scientists uh, of classical Greece. And uh, and at the sorry at the center of this image, you see probably the two most influential thinkers, certainly in the in the West. Uh, Plato on the right pointing upward and Aristotle pointing uh, downwards. I've got to remind you that for many hundreds of years, in fact, for, probably for 1,400 years, the man on the right was simply known as the philosopher, and everybody knew who, uh, who they were referring to because he was so influential. So the first, no, um, one of the earliest notions of what, 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 what is soul I'd like to untangle soul and mind and brain and consciousness. One of the earliest notions comes to us from Aristotle, written in his book um, De Anima on the, on the psyche, on the soul, where he defines sort of soul as the essential form of, of any organism. So he defines what, what, what exists and what, what makes a house a house and a dog a dog and, and what, what makes an organism. And the essence of that organism is a soul. And then they had a, um, he had a hierarchy of souls, um, depending on which organism we're talking about. So common to all living organisms, whether you're a plant or dog or human, is the fact that there's a nutritional soul. So the fact that, that all these organisms, plants, animals, and people, are obviously alive. And so that's a, you can think of it also as a, the life principle, the nutritional soul. <clears throat> Then there was the, uh, the, the called the sensitive soul or the locomotive soul or the appetitive soul, that aspect that only animals and people had that allowed us to move, to act purposely, to sense, to hear, to, to see, to smell, etc. That's common to animals and to people. And then uh, there's the rational soul that, uh, that some people have. Well, not every human has it. Babies, for instance, don't have it. Uh, they don't have it yet. Um, if your brain injured, you we lost it, or at the extreme end of life in dementia, you may also have lost it, but normal adults do. The power of thinking of intellect. Now, the, 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 this, these are all immaterial uh, souls, and it's not quite clear, and there's a big dispute going on since 2,000 years, whether or not Aristotle thought that the last one is actually immortal. It's not really clear. Uh, under some reading of Aristotle, either he doesn't say anything at all, or he argues that uh, upon the death, the, this rational soul will also disappear. Plato, of course, famously differed and argued that the rational soul is, uh, is um, eternal, just like all the other ideas of, uh, of Plato. And that via then uh, Plato and his followers, it was taken up by uh, Christianity, and then was really by Thomas Aquinas, one of the principal um, uh, uh, theologians of the, um, of the scholastic, sort of this notion of the soul as the first principle of life was adopted into, into Christian thought and remains to, uh, with us today, 2,500 years later, not among scientists, not among uh, philosophers, but it's very widespread in the public at large. What really makes us, us and what really consciousness ultimately is about a soul that's both immaterial as well as immortal. Now, one, one thing I wanted to point out that today we sort of we live in an age 
uh, where sort of it's a truism that you are your brain. But that's this, this is relatively recent vintage. In fact, again, for thousands of years, for most of uh, recorded history, we thought the really, what's really key to people is their heart. So for instance, interesting fact here, during mummification in ancient Egypt, when you took the pharaoh, you sucked out his brain through his nostril and you threw it away. And the, the priest very carefully preserved all of his other organs. So in his, in his afterlife, he had access to everything, except he didn't have a brain. But they, because they didn't worry about it because they didn't think the brain was important. Aristotle famously argued that the brain is there to cool the, um, to cool the heart, that the seat of, uh, of, of reason and emotion is the heart. Old, the Old and New Testament foundational documents of Christianity are filled with references to the heart, but not a single. There's not a single reference in either the Old nor the New Testament to the, um, to the brain. And in fact, Christian iconography is filled with images of sacred hearts. And I personally have never heard anybody to want, who went to a sacred brain academy <laughs> or a sacred brain um, you know, church. Now, and this remains with us today. You say you love somebody with your heart, you give your sweetheart a, a heart-shaped uh, shaped chocolate. What you should really give your sweetheart is, um, is um, amygdala-shaped or a hypothalamic-shaped <laughs> piece of chocolate. Um, and and the, the brain-centric view is really something relatively modern. It, it, it really originated in the, in the 15th and 16th century, although you can go back and you can see some people way back fourth century before common era, Hippocrates, the person after whom we know, uh, after whom we name the Hippocratic Oath that doctors have to, have to abide by, he says very explicitly, 2,400 years ago, man ought to know that from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, and jest, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears. Again, we know this. If you, today, you can transplant a heart, and you don't change the character of the person, since the character of, per, of the person independent whether he's heartless or not, doesn't reside in his heart. It resides fully in his, um, in his brain. All language hasn't caught up to that. Now, the, the most important philosophers, for my mind, for the mind-body problem and for philosophy in mind in general, who's also the foundation father of, um, of uh, science, is René Descartes, physicist, mathematician, and philosopher, French, lived most of his adult, or much of his adult life in Holland. And in his um, most famous little book uh, on the method, he tried to be the ultimate skeptic and to introspect what is it that he's absolutely sure of? What is it is beyond any doubt? And he talks about a deceiver that might deceive him, but he says one thing is for sure, I am. Uh, in particular, he said, I think, therefore, I am. The one thing I know is that I have conscious sensation of feelings, and that is the one that's the one rock bottom certainty I have. I might be deceived about the way I look. I might be perceived, maybe I think I'm beautiful, but I'm actually ugly, etc. But the fact is that I, I do have this perception that I'm beautiful or not, that I do have pains and pleasures and can hear and, and think, that means I have to exist. And w once again, this comes prior to any knowledge about people, about stars, about science and physics, all that comes afterwards. The first is only knowledge, philosophers say, the only knowledge, I've, the only thing I have direct knowledge of is my own conscious sensation. And, and of course, we know since Immanuel Kant and other uh, um, philosophers that we don't really ever have access to the outside world. The only thing I know is, is my own internal um, uh, mind. And then I can corroborate what my mind figures out with what other people say. And then I can do it with the objective methods of, of science. But things out there, I don't ever have direct access to. The only thing I know is, is, uh, is, uh, is my own consciousness. So in modern language, we said this, in modern uh, language, he, uh, I'm conscious, therefore I am. And interestingly, he also identified the first sort of neural focus, what people now call the neural college of consciousness. He said with them, with them, the, 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 the brain and the body machine, he talks about um, res extans, this, that, that the stuff out of which brains are made, whether they're human or animal brains, meets the mind that only human have. He was very explicit about that. If in this pineal gland, the little gland in the, in, the, in the middle of the brain, he had an interesting reason for choosing it, but it turned out to be wrong. 
All right, so this is a human brain. It's, yeah, big. it's actually much smaller than people think because you don't see the brain, you only see the skull. And of course, the skull takes up considerable amount, amount of brain. The, 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 the brain is much smaller than the skull. And above, uh, on the upper right, you see probably the most popular brain that's studied worldwide um, in the clinic and among scientists, which is the brain of a mouse, which is roughly a thousand times smaller. It's remarkable similar to the brain of a human. In fact, only an expert armed with a microscope can tell, if I give you a little grain, and I, don't, I won't tell you is it a mouse or monkey or dog or human brain or whale brain, only an expert armed with a microscope can say for certain this is a human or this is a mouse. The basic stuff is all the same. We're all made out of the same stuff. We have more of it, roughly a thousand times more, but then other animals like whales and and elephants have even bigger brains than, than us, and we don't quite understand why. All right, so the, the uh, I guess we can, we can skip this. The, the, the birth of sort of the modern conception of the brain, where specific bits and pieces of the brain are involved in, in doing specific things, really originated in the early um, 19th century by this guy who also started phrenology. Which, which now we know phrenology isn't a real science, but the basic insight upon the, this was based is still a valid one, and we still believe today. In fact, we can validate it now with magnetic scanning methods that specific bits and pieces of the brain are responsible for specific bits and pieces of what we do, what we see, what we think, what we learn, what we remember. And so, if you if you have a stroke and the stroke is relatively localized, or you have a distraction of small bits and pieces of the brain, you can lose specific functions. You can lose the ability to speak, or you can lose the ability to see in color, or you can uh, lose the ability to uh, remember familiar people, like your wife to whom you're married for 30 years. That's because you have lost specific pieces of brain that subserve that specific function. And then, uh, this is really the birth of functional neurology in the, in the mid-19th century in, in Paris. When a, um, when a neurologist, uh, Pierre Paul Broca, found a few patients that had a very specific deficit. So we, we, the, the most interesting cases uh, for, to understand about the, um, the body in general is when you have patients that have a very specific deficit that you can tie to a specific organ or to a specific place in the organ. So here he found several patients that had a stroke on the lower left inferior frontal gyrus, roughly here. And then the, the person seemed normal, and he could hear, and he could follow instruction, and he had normal intelligence, etc. but he was unable to speak. He was so-called aphasic. And so then uh, you can see the distraction there on the, on, the front, on, on the front left of that brain. That's the original brain from this patient. And so from that, he inferred that this specific part of the brain is responsible for speaking language. And, and we know it's true, it's typically on the left. In a few people, it's on the right. And so in, in his honor, we name that area Broca. But so, so he was important because of this locationist principle, that, that the brain isn't equipotential. It's not true that the entire brain does everything, but specific aspects of the brain do specific things. And then to understand consciousness and how consciousness uh, um, arose, we really can't do that, or you cannot understand anything in biology and anything in, in medicine uh, without the context of, uh, of evolution by natural selection, right? The realization that all of us, whether we are, um, whether we are a giant sequoia or goldfish or mouse or human or whale, we're all closely related. We share the genetic code. We share the, um, uh, most of our organism. And as I said, the hardware of the brain, in fact, is, is very similar to the extent that we can study the neurological diseases um, in animals, because that teaches us a lot about, about the, 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 counter, the, the human counterparts. And so to, to understand how something like experience arises, uh, something like consciousness, we really have to understand it in context of that we are just the latest flowering of conscious experience, <coughs> that consciousness itself, the capability to have experiences, is probably much more widespread. It's not only true for us, not only true for monkeys and cats and dogs and mice, but it may be we don't know at this point. It may be much more widespread. It might include, uh, for example, all biological organisms, as many people believe on this planet. It's a very ancient faith. Uh, one variant of this is called panpsychism. Pan, as in everywhere, universal, and psyche, like in soul, that everything is in soul. Um, and, and certainly modern science would, would, uh, would, would be closer to that attitude than the attitude of 
classical Christianity that only humans um, uh, have conscious experience. There's, there's really no ev supporting evidence for that. So by consciousness, most people, most philosophers, not all, but most mean any experience, whether the experience of seeing red, or being depressed, or being excited, or, or remembering something, or remembering what I had for breakfast, or being in love. Those, those are all different conscious experiences. And they all have different qualities associated with them, but what's common to all, they, they feel like something. Uh, so let me see. So can you all fixate the central cause? Just fixate the central cause, it's a very striking illusion. And what do you see? <coughs> Hello. <laughs> what do you see? And how many, if you really, so keep your eyes on that central cause. How many discs do you see? Only one, right? No, if you keep your eyes, so um, if you keep your eyes steady on the, on the fixation, all the existing discs, the stationary one disappears, and you'll only see one, a green one. So what's remarkable about this illusion is what's actually out there, which is 11 stationary pink disks you don't see. And what you see very clearly, this, this single green traveling disk isn't there. It's a hole. It's a very interesting illusion. But the, the point of this is, A, to show that, yes, we can be terribly deluded exactly about what we're seeing. But that we're seeing something, in this case green, most of us, except if you're colorblind, is, uh, is without any doubt. And that there's a lawful relationship. We do understand, so perceptual psychologists understand why you have this particular illusion. Now, when we talk about consciousness, there's really a transitive and a non-transitive usage we have to distinguish. So there's, there are states of consciousness, um, and there are conscious states. So, the, um, so, so, so first of all, the, uh, I, I spoke about different content of consciousness. So as I said, before your content was filled with a single green traveling disc, or you can be angry, or you can worry, about, you know, you can be hungry and think about your next dinner. So there, you're conscious, and you have different, your, the content of your consciousness changes. That, is, that has to be distinguished from being in different states of consciousness. Like tonight, all of us are going to go to bed, ultimately, and fall asleep. And that's in deep sleep particular, it's a different state of consciousness, which is characterized typically when you wake up, typically by having no experience whatsoever. When, you wake, when I wake you from a deep sleep, uh, as checked by EG, most of the time people will, if I, uh, will, 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 will respond to the question, what went through your mind a couple of seconds before, they say nothing. But then also, at different times in your sleep, if I wake you up, you will have experiences. You will fly, you will talk too long, dead friends and relatives and loved ones and, and pets, etc. And we call those dreams. That's a different conscious state. So, um, and we know the brain is differentially regulated. So there you have three different states, um, uh, uh, states of conscious. And then there are other clinical important states. There's, for example, the state of anesthesia, where your consciousness is artificially turned off. And then there are pathological states, like persistent, like vegetative state, unresponsive wakefulness, etc. You might remember some of the older ones might remember this was with a very famous patient, Terry Schiavo. And for 14 years, she was in a state um, that was called by the medical co um, community persistent vegetative state. It lasted for 14 years. And as far as we can tell, she had four separate medical examinations. All the evidence suggests that she wasn't there anymore, that she had some brainstem reflexes left. So typically, these patients will open their eyes, they'll close their eyes, they have circadian rhythms. Sometimes they can move, sometimes they can groan. But there isn't anybody home anymore. The true Terry Shiro died 14 years earlier. And this is her brain at, at autopsy. We know quite a bit about these patients. I'll come back to them in a, in a bit. What is it we can say for certain about consciousness? Well, so we know it's a consciousness associated with certain types of systems, biological systems. Not all of them. Your liver, for example, for reasons we don't really fully understand, is not conscious. You don't, you have no idea what goes on in, in your liver, none whatsoever. Uh, why? We don't know. But you, do, you are conscious of some of the times, 
of what goes on in this part of the brain, uh, in this part of the body, your brain. But there are other systems, for example, it's immune system, very complicated system. There are multiple subsystems. They have memory, right? You can form an antibody. But it, it does all of its action silently. There's no, you don't have any phenomenal experience. Why? We don't really know. We know from the clinic and we know from, from dreaming when your body is paralyzed so you don't act out your dreams that consciousness doesn't require behavior. We know that consciousness uh, from patients, uh, that consciousness doesn't require emotions. So you can have patients, they're totally flat affect because the, let's say the, the, the part of the brain was destroyed, but they, they, so they, they don't have fear or, or, or hate or anger anymore, yet they're, they're perfectly conscious. We know from experiments that you can, this is interesting for teachers, that you can attend to things without being conscious of them. So you can attend to a voice or you can attend to an image without actually seeing it. Other interesting experiments over the last 10 years. We know consciousness does not require language. Uh, for instance, babies, uh, we believe, are conscious, yet they don't speak. Um, and also, consciousness doesn't really require self-consciousness. Or put differently, self-consciousness is one peculiar aspect of consciousness, namely the ability to reflect upon myself. So I, I know that I'm a man. I know I'm going to die. One day I can reflect what happens after I die and all of those things. It's not very well developed in babies, um, and it's not very well developed in, in others. But during normal life, this isn't all as important. It isn't as important as it's cracked up to be. When you are engaged in a um, rock climber, or used to be a rock climber, when you're climbing, you're, that inner voice that always accompanies you, that inner critic is totally silent because you're so busy focusing on the world. When you're driving in high-speed traffic on a bike, when you're making love, when you're watching an engaging movie, when you're reading an engaging book, you're out there in the world or in your head without sort of reflecting upon yourself. So self-consciousness is there, certainly there in, in humans, but it's not required for consciousness. We know from patients that you don't need to have memory, long-term memory. So there's some patients, they have no idea, you know, it's like a cliff. Everything falls off that's, that's older than one minute, but they're fully conscious. They can tell you whether they're hungry or not in, in one beautiful case. The patient is still in love with his wife 20 years after he, they married because he's, there is no record of the intervening 20 years of him, and his state is exactly the same as it was two weeks after his, uh, his marriage when he had a, um, a bad case of viral encephalitis. And we know from split brain experiments that consciousness can exist in one cortical hemisphere. It doesn't require both. And we know, I mentioned this already, some of you may have read Oliver Sacks, a neurologist who died last year, that um, if you lose specific bits and pieces of your brain, you lose specific parts of consciousness, not, not as a whole. But if I lose a little bit of my cortex here and there, as I said, I can, I can maybe I'm unable to see motion. My life looks like in a strobe light, in a disco. Maybe I'm unable to see color, or maybe I don't recognize uh, familiar people, but I'm, I'm still conscious as a whole. It's just I've lost specific aspects of consciousness. And then there is this, um, this idea that was introduced um, <coughs> uh, last century by Francis Crick and myself. This idea what we should be doing now in, in consciousness rather than having internal debates with philosophers that don't seem to end is to sort of to trigger an empirical and a scientific experimental program to look for the, for the footprints really, to look for the footprints of consciousness in the brain. And the way you do it, so, so the way you do it is you, you, you try to identify cases when you, when you can isolate particular parts of the brain that we believe are responsible for specific conscious percepts. And so first of all, we introduce this idea of the neural correlate of consciousness. So when you, for example, right now, you should be conscious of my voice with this funny Germanic accent. And so there's some specific mechanism in your brain that will give rise to the sensation of this voice. And then, where is that? Which part of the brain is it? And if I trigger that artificially, like in a matrix, in a science fiction scenario, or with, a, with the electrode of a neurosurgeon, you should be able to hear this voice. And sometimes you do when the surgeon stimulates your brain. And if I remove it, or if you lose that part of the brain, you shouldn't be able to hear my voice, even though your ears, there's nothing wrong with your ears. And then you can ask, well, how, how is, the, how is the, 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 this neuronal correlate for my voice different from 
the voice of your, your spouse, your child, or our president? Is it the same set of neurons and they just fire slightly differently? And how is that different from hearing a bark of a dog? Is it a very different part of the brain? And how is that different from when I see something or when I hear or when I'm in love? These are all different conscious states. In each case, you can ask, what is the commonality? Where, where, what mechanism in the brain gives specifically rise to this sensation and to other sensations? Are they all linked? Are they in one part of the brain? Do they buzz at a particular frequency? These are all hypotheses that people have made. All right, so there are sophisticated ways. I'm going to skip all of that. There are quite sophisticated ways, these, uh, ways to, uh, to, define, to define this, um, these neuronal correlates of consciousness. And then we have to distinguish those from background condition and from enabling condition. This is very important conceptually. This is the person who first characterized a terrible disease that most of us have forgotten, mercifully, because we still don't know what caused it, and we still don't know whether there's any cure. It's called a sleeping sickness, encephalica lethargica. It swept the world between 1916 and 1926. It came out of the battlefields of World War I in Flanders and France and Belgium. And um, this is separate from the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu, we know, it caused 50 to 100 million people to death. It was in the variant of H1N1. This one we don't know. And it's not clear whether there is a connection to Spanish flu or not. This one was a disease. The people that were struck by it, they went, most of them went into extreme state of sleepiness, where they slept for 20 or 22 hours a day, for days, weeks, months, sometimes for years. Many would die. Some had the opposite. Some would, uh, had this hypervigilantism. They couldn't go to sleep at all anymore. And on the basis of this evidence, this doctor von Economo in, in Vienna identified parts, uh, two different parts of the brain as specific centers to regulate wakefulness and sleepness, sleep. So until then, most people thought, well, sleep is just sort of, you know, the brain just runs down like a machine out of fuel and just runs down. It's just a passive thing. But since then, we know, no, sleep is highly active. It's an active state actively maintained by the brain for its own purposes, and wakeful is also an active state, and some of those mechanisms are destroyed, then you might get this, um, this sleeping sickness. In fact, there's a beautiful movie called Awakening. Some of you have seen it. So those patients, those are all late-stage post-Parkinson um, patients. Those patients were all in their youth had a sleeping sickness, and then long-term it went to this extreme um, Parkinson where they couldn't move at all anymore. Those are the people who survived it, and some of them had this, um, had this post um, encephalitis Parkinson <coughs> that uh, Oliver Sacks and tried to cure with uh, Aldopa. Anyhow, so the, uh, the, the enabling conditions, those are a background conditions that need to be in place in order for you to be conscious at all. So your heart has to beat, for instance. If your heart doesn't beat, you faint within 10 seconds and consciousness is turned off. Um, you, you have to have a neuromodulator in the brain stem. They have to be active. Um, um, in order to, to, to give rise to consciousness. Those are all background conditions. Those don't mediate consciousness per se, but those are background conditions that need to be present in order for you to be conscious. All right. So I mentioned this. So we, we can ask, so where, where, where is this sort of this neural footprint of consciousness? So you might know, for instance, there's the neuron CS, your second brain, called the enteric nervous system in the gut, couple of hundred millions, and you can feel unwell, of course, if you had too much to eat or you're, you, know, you feel nauseated or you're going to throw up. But it turns out those sensations, those conscious sensations, unpleasant usually, these epigastric feelings are not generated here, but they're generated in part of the cortex. So that gives rise to the question, is maybe the enteric nervous system conscious, but it's not telling us? Let me show you a few bits and pieces of the brain that we know are not involved in consciousness. So there is this brain, the little brain, at the back of your brain. It's called the cerebellum. We need it in order to do fine, you know, if you want to thread a needle or go rock climbing or dancing or play tennis or anything like that, you need your cerebellum. If you don't have it, because you, let's say, have a stroke or virus or a tumor or something, then, you, then people will start getting ataxic. They start you know, having very shaky movements. They get what's known as the, um, as the cerebellar cognitive affective disorders. Their speech will become slurred, unsteady gait, etc. Yet these patients never complain about 
disruption of consciousness. It's not that they see the world differently or hear it or experience it differently. And then a couple of years ago, this lady was, um, came to a clinic in China and was imaged. Okay, it's a 24-year-old year lady who complained of, of headaches and got an in, uh, infection. Her brain got scanned and she was discovered she has no cerebellum. So at the back of her brain, and that should all be filled with, in fact, the majority of your neurons from the most complex one, the Purkinje cells, and 80% of all your neurons are in the cerebellum. So if you don't have them, like this lady, she had some minor, she had, was slightly ataxic. She, she spoke with an impediment. She did speak. She could talk about her experiences. She was married. She had a child, etc. cetera. But, 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 but the fact is she was, she was still fully conscious. So that, that, that's very interesting, right? Because where you don't find something can be as indicative as where you do find things. So that tells us it can't just be any piece of neuronal tissue that gives rise to conscious sensation. Because here you have lots of neurons, some of them very beautiful, yet they don't seem to, by themselves, be, be sufficient to give rise to consciousness. So that raises the question, well, what is it about other bits and pieces of the brain that does give rise to consciousness? So for example, when we talk about vision, which is my specialty, I'm a visual scientist, we know that the eyes are not the place where I see. One reason is I can close my eyes and still sort of imagine you. Second reason is almost all of our dreams are visual. And uh, at night, it's dark, and my eyes are closed, and I have very vivid visual percepts. So I know it's not my eyes. And also, when I look at the character of my eye, of the nerves in my eyes, they are very different from the way I see. You may have heard there's a blind spot in your eye, right in your visual field. It's roughly here. I don't see that consciously. My eyes move three to four times a second, yet I don't experience that. So for all sorts of reasons, we know that, that, the, that the neurons, the nerve cells in the, in the back of the eye are necessary for, for taking the photons in, you know, for caching the stream of photons and converting that into conscious percepts. But that, that, that conversion from neural activity to consciousness happens upstairs, doesn't happen in the eye. Okay, let's skip these experiments. So some of the best evidence we have is from the clinic and from scientific um, um, experiments in the lab. This is one of the nicest experiments. This is the brain is viewed from below. So that the back is here at the bottom, and the top is the frontal lobe. And this shows you where um, a doctor put electrodes. This is in epileptic patients, and for various clinical reasons, sometimes you have to put electrodes into them to test, uh, to, test uh, for, to run some diagnostic tests. And here they could test in a particular part of the brain called the fusiform face area. It's an abbreviation that scientists have shown to, to designate those areas on the underside of the of cortex, on the left and on the right, that give rise to our perception of faces. So whenever I see a face, here or in a movie or dream of a face, or imagine my, my mom's face, we know because we can put people in a magnet and we can see it, these parts of the brain light up. And now they stimulate them, the neurosurgeon stimulates, and sees, well, whenever I stimulate, but interestingly, only on the right, not on the left, for reasons we don't understand, um, you can actually induce a percept. You can actually induce a facial percept, or when the patient looks at the doctor, while stimulating his face area, the, the face of the doctor sort of changes in weird and unpredictable ways. So that's pretty cool. All right, let's skip that, let's skip that. So here there are... Um, Two mammals, my daughter and her gorgeous German Shepherd. I believe, she believes, and I think most people believe certainly that both are conscious. Um, the dogs certainly are conscious. Anybody who's had dogs or been around dogs or cats or other animals would, would agree with me. I'm not saying that my that dogs, German Shepherds, or any other dogs, sort of sit there and ponder the future and wonder, hmm, my tail wags in a funny way. Maybe there's something wrong with it. <laughs> dogs don't do that. Dogs are sort of more Buddhist, right? They're in the here and now, and they, you know, they wear their emotions on their sleeves, so to speak. Right? They're happy or sad or depressed or, or anxious, but, but, you, but it's certainly behaviorally, and you can tell by their bark and by the position of their ears and by their tails, etc., they communicate their internal states to you. Just like a mute person does or like a child does that doesn't speak, yet, or like a patient or like a demented person who, who, who's lost the power of, of speech. So because of the, um, the similarity of behavior, the behavior is not the same, of course. We are very specialized. 
each species specialized. We're not like dogs, but there's a great deal of similarity. This is the brain architecture, once again, is very similar. The brain is smaller than ours, but the structure, the individual neurons, the synapses, the genes are very similar. And the, we know there's a close evolutionary uh, relationship, 60 million years. The main thing that makes us, what we have, is a highly developed sense of self, of self-conscious language, and a highly developed sense of importance. Overdeveloped sense of importance. <laughs> so look at this video here. and see what, what sort of intention, what conscious intention you can impute to this little, this little fellow. The wild type mouth. I mean, if you look at this, I find it extremely difficult to believe that they don't have, uh, you know, conscious, clearly here an intention, right, that they have an intentionality like we do when you're hungry and you, you know, you run a mile in order to get food. Okay, so there are lots of questions in the field of consciousness that we need answers to. So I briefly mentioned what, what seems to generate new, um, conscious activity is a piece of the forebrain at the top called the cortex. It's most highly developed in us. It's, it's like a pizza, really. It's a 14-inch pizza. It's two to three millimeter thick. And then two of them are highly convolved in, a, uh, in our skull. And activity, electrical activity, in bits and pieces of cortex, particularly the back of the brain, they seem to be necessary to give rise to any conscious sensation, whether it's you know, all the different conscious sensations I have. Now, why? <coughs> Why is the cerebellum, as I mentioned, the cerebellum doesn't seem to have this magical property. It doesn't seem to be involved in consciousness. It's involved in plenty of other things, but not in consciousness. Why? During cortex, uh, during the, uh, epileptic seizures, so some people believe that, that synchronized electrical activity is really critical for consciousness. During an epileptic seizure attack, your brain is hypersynchronized, yet patients lose consciousness. During deep sleep, it's not true that the brain is shut off in, 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 in deep sleep. When you record from individual neural activity or you record EG, it's certainly active. The activity is different. The pattern of neurons are different, but they spike. They show electrical activity just like being awake. Yet, as I said, if you wake people up, they don't seem to experience anything. What about this is a, um, this is a locked-in patient. So this is a patient, you may have seen the movie The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, who because of a stroke in the brain stem has lost any ability to move, and typically can only communicate with eye movements, typically only vertical eye movements. Um, now, it, sometimes those patients will even lose the ability to communicate or never have it in the first place, so then how do we know somebody's in there? If, if, if a patient like that has lost all ability to communicate, the evidence seems to suggest he's fully conscious, but how do we, how do we know this? Then there are patients like this. So this is a, a, a patient who's been since many years in clinical care of Nico Schiff. And uh, there are these islands of activity that are left in his brain. And he says one, one word over and over and over and over again. That's the only thing he ever says, like a, like a little tape recorder on, on endless loop. And there are these uh, few brain islands left. Is he conscious? Is he experiencing something? And what? Is it agony? Is it pain? Is it boredom? More questions. So at the beginning of life, we don't know when is the first time you experienced anything. Now, we don't remember that because we have childhood amnesia. But was it a fetus inside the mother's womb? It's clearly alive. But does a fetus experience something? We don't know. Is it possible that when you exit the birth canal of your mom, you have this massive surge in adrenaline? You have to breathe for the first time by yourself. You're in this 
loud and, and cool environment compared to the protective environment of your mom, is that when you're first conscious and when you cry, or is it later? What about a, a preterm? This is a 24-year-old preterm. Clearly, uh, the baby's alive, but is the baby conscious of anything yet? We don't know. This is, uh, 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 this is um, electrical um, EG activity um, of, um, uh, of a model of a near-death experience. Uh, you can see the EG is flat towards uh, the last thousand uh, seconds, and it went, uh, there was cardiac arrest there. Is this subject experiencing anything like a near-death experience? We don't know. They're very special cases. Um, this is uh, two little girls in um, Vancouver, north of Seattle, and they're grown together. They have a, their brains are partially locked. They have what's called a thalamic bridge, where the evidence seems to suggest that they're, they, are, they have two bodies, but their brain only may be connected or is connected at the level of the thalamus. So is it really one mind? Sometimes, I mean, they, they can speak independently, but sometimes they look like they're one, they're, they're sort of one mind. What about sleepwalking? Are people, uh, um, a patient who sleepwalk, or people who sleepwalk conscious? The evidence seems to suggest no, but we don't know. More questions. What about group mind? Many people claim that there's a group mind, that, for example, if we all interact, there's something above and beyond our individual consciousness. There's a group consciousness. Is that true? What about animals that are very different? So I, th I think the case, at least scientifically, is relatively easy to make that other mammals, like cats and dogs and mice, are conscious. But what about an animal like this? Very complex, 800,000 neurons, can recognize individual faces, does a bee dance, has very complicated rules for choosing you know, the, the hive, highly complex brain, 10 times more dense than a human brain. Does it feel like anything to be a, a, a bee? We simply don't know right now. They are very different from us, so we don't, our intu intuition failed us. We just say, well, they're just bugs. But that's really just a bias. We simply don't know. And then, of course, the challenge of our times is we're now confronted increasingly, and I'll come back to this, with creatures that if a, if a, if a patient would behave like Siri or like any of the other things that we now, there would be no question we would say that patient is conscious. So on what basis can we deny conscious awareness to, to machines that are becoming increasingly more, more um, that are becoming increasingly more complex? So in order, so the, the, the last point I want to make, in order to answer these questions, we really need a theory. We need a principal theory, an axiomatic theory, that tells us in all these cases, we need to know answers to all those cases. And by itself, empirical science, we, we, what we need beyond looking for the footprints of consciousness, we need a principled answer that tells us what is it about the physics of the brain or the physics of any other mechanism that gives rise to conscious sensation. We believe, all the evidence suggests, that our brains are part of the natural universe, that there isn't, in principle, anything different from our brains than from any other piece of matter in the universe. Um, or that our brain isn't different from our liver or any other of our other organs. Yet the brain, and only the brain, seems to give rise to conscious sensation. And so we have to ask, what is it about the physics of highly excitable pieces of matter that gives rise to conscious experience? And can, can, I, can other creatures also have it, like cats and dogs? And how far low does it go? Does it go to, fly, to bees and flies and worms and maybe bacteria? And then I need to know the answer to the question, can Machines can artificial physical systems that we design that are not evolved like us, but that we design, can they do be conscious? And then this theory has to then make certain predictions that I can then test. Okay, there is such a theory. I can't talk about it. I simply don't have time. It's, it's a complicated, invented by this uh, uh, Italian-American psychiatrist, neuroscientist, Giulio Tononi. It's called integrated, in, in, integrated Information Theory. It's a principal theory that goes from some, some axiom, some so-called transcendental properties that every experience has to obey. So every experience has to exist. It has to be particular. It has to be, um, it has to have part. It has to be one. It has to be only one. From that, it derives um, sort of postulate properties that any mechanism, like a brain or a computer or a bunch of chips or a bunch of coke can, any mechanism has to obey in order to satisfy those, those five um, axioms. And then the, the, the theory, it's a mathematical theory, 
as I said, it says, here I have a mechanism, a brain, and it's in a particular state. These neurons are on, those neurons are off. Or it could be a computer where some, new, some transistors are switched on and some transistors are switched off. It doesn't matter. The theory says I have a mechanism in a state, and it predicts, the theory predicts on, on, on uh, using, using the power of mathematics, it, it predicts which specific system is conscious. And uh, it makes a fundamental assumption that, that, that consciousness is cause effect power upon itself. That doesn't mean anything to you. You just for now have to accept it because it gives rise to some interesting prediction. So it's causal power. It's causal power that the system has upon itself. The, ca the causal power that the brain has to change its own f future state and to be changed by its past state. And any mechanism that has causal power upon itself will have some modicum of consciousness associated with it. It's just a theory that th says we live in a universe where any system that has causal power upon itself, maximum cause effect power upon itself, Will, have, will be conscious. You can quantify the, uh, how much consciousness it, this system uh, generates by a number called phi. It's a positive number. And you can uh, generate, you can uh, predict the quality, whether it's a color or a sound or something else. It's a beautiful theory. Now, the theory sounds to most people like uh, also sort of trained scientists, like, well, OK, it's just a theory. You know, you can make many theories. It's nice. It's beautiful. It's mathematically consistent. People admit that, but it's after all, it's a theory. So how do I know it's true? You have to breathe life into the theory and make predictions. And so for instance, now, we're in a position where the theory predicts that if I take a brain and the brain is conscious, the brain has to be highly integrated. In fact, it has to be integrated because every one of my, my experiences so is, in, is, is, a, is, a, is a holistic integrated experience. When I see you, I don't see the left half separate from the right half. When I think about the word honeymoon, I don't see honey, you know, stuff that bees make in moon, the, 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 the object in the sky, but I have this perception of honeymoon, the trip that, that people go on when they're married. So it's a unitary, and it's also highly differentiated. Every experience could be one of a trillion experiences. If you think about every frame of every movie you've ever seen, each one is a discrete visual experience. So, so let's try to find a measure so I can actually test whether a patient or a normal person or an anesthetized person is conscious by measuring how differentiated and integrated the, the, the brain is. So this appeared 10 years ago in science. So well, what they used to know it out, it's now a large group of, uh, of um, clinicians, they use a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a figure of eight coil, and it sends magnetic pulses into the brain. Think of it like a bell. Think of the brain a little bit like a church bell. And I want to I wanna hear whether the church bell is intact and nicely integrated. So for example, the Liberty Bell has a crack in it in Philadelphia. So if you hit with a hammer, you'll, you'll, it'll sound very different. If the church bell is nice, integrated, it'll, it'll ring. You can ring it and ring for, it'll resonate for a long time. That's essentially what, what is being done here. You hit the brain with these little magnetic pulses of magnetic energy, and then you measure the response of the brain with a, uh, with a net, dense net of EG electrodes. OK? So here, for example, here you have a, a subject that's awake, sitting there, and you do this, let's say, 100 or 200 times in a couple of minutes. And each time you record the underlying brain wave. And so you get this, um, this activity here at the bottom. You see the activity. So it, you know, the lowest row you see, I initiate this pulse on the right uh, frontal uh, motor cortex, and then it travels forward. The wave of activity travels back. It travels around the brain. And in principle, I can compute the complexity of it. I can, I can see, I can, I can get a mathematical measure how complex is this, um, is this electrical activity, and I call this PCI, Perturbational Complexing Index. Never mind. It's a number between 0 and 1. Zero, it's, um, 1, it says maximal complex, and 0, it says no, com uh, no complexity at all, like if there's no activity or the activity is completely stationary. And now I can do this in different people. I can measure how complex, how integrated is the brain response. This, for example, is in deep sleep. So the person is deeply asleep. I can see that on his EG. And I give the pulse. And initially, the pulse gives rise even to a bigger EG signal, but it's stunted. It's much shorter, much less complex, and stops after 120 milliseconds. While in a wake brain, it can go on for hundreds of milliseconds. So this, this PCI number is, is, is a low number. They've done this in many, people, in many volunteers who sleep and awake, 
and you get a distribution. And so you can tell just by looking at this PCI number whether the person is, uh, is asleep or not. But now much more interesting are the clinical cases because there we really need help. So on the left is what happens if you anesthetize people. And uh, there isn't really a good conscious ometer around. There is not. Uh, there is nothing around right now that reliable tells me, independent of the anesthetic, whether or not a person is conscious. And this is what this device is trying to do. On the right is a patient in coma. So most of the people don't know. But in the US alone, there are probably 10,000 patients who are either in coma or in closed states like vegetative state, persistent vegetative state, minimum conscious state, emerging conscious state. In various, these are people, 20 years ago they would have died, but today because of you know, rescue helicopters and emergency room technicians, all of that, we can pull these people back from the brink of death. And then they, very often they can hover in these, in these states where they're clearly alive, uh, but you, you have no way to communicate with the patient or only very minimal ways. And at some point, it becomes very difficult to know, to know is, this, is there anybody home there? Terry Shiro was a very obvious, unambiguous case. Many other patients are much more ambiguous. And so therefore, it's critical to have such a, such a device. And so there's a bunch of studies. This is the latest studies. Essentially, what you're trying to do, you, so you take people, volunteers, you anesthetize them when you know that they are unconscious from, from clinical practice. Or you take um, other patients when you know that they're awake, like locked-in syndrome patients, I mentioned you, they're clearly conscious. Or stroke patients that had, had minimal damage, but that, that were conscious, you can, talk, you can speak to them. Or person that emerged from minimal conscious states. And, and you can sort of calibrate this, this number, this index. So you have like a, a conscious ometer, and you, you essentially sort of measure how conscious are they. And you can see. When, when you have uh, behavioral evidence from the clinic to indicate that the patient is conscious, um, this index is above a number, 0 0.031, doesn't matter. And if, if all the evidence suggests either because they're deeply asleep or because they're anesthetized or from clinical, from um, coma scales, et cetera, the patient's unconscious, this number is low. So that's very good. So now you can test it in patients, which is much more difficult, certain minimal conscious states. When you ask the patient follow the you know follow with the eyes, and the patient may only do it once out of ten times, or or um, you know apply pressure, uh, you know respond or do something, and very often you just don't know whether there's a response there or is it just sort of a, a brainstem reflex or vegetative state um, patient, as I mentioned like Terry Schiavo. Some of them it's very difficult to know are they conscious or not, and so this measure works quite well to tell you. So it would be, if it's now validated in larger clinical practice, it would be the first measure that, that's a principal measure that tells you is a patient that I'm right now testing, is that patient conscious or not? Now the theory makes a number of very surprising predictions that could be tested. For instance, it says, very well, one experiment I mentioned already is a split brain experiment. It was first done 40 years ago when you cut the, there are 200 million fibers that link the left and the right brain. And sometimes to prevent epileptic seizures, the surgeon has to cut them. And the theory clearly says under those conditions, you will get two conscious entity in one skull. You talk to only one, because typically you talk to the left hemisphere. So typically you have to anesthetize the left hemisphere. You can do that by injecting sodium amethyl to talk to the right hemisphere. But the theory says, and the evidence seems to suggest that in these people, there are two conscious minds. One looks out of my, one lives in my right brain and looks in that direction, and the other one, talk, is my left and looks in that direction. Now, the theory also says I can do the opposite experiment. I can take my brain and connect it with somebody else's brain. And here, it's really interesting, and I'm, this will be done in animals, and in future, I imagine that people will also do this because you get some very surprising experiences. So if I connect my brain with, my, with somebody else's brain, at first, if there are only a few wires, I can sort of read out some of what that other person is thinking. But he's still he and I'm still me. But at some point, the theory predicts there's an abrupt point at which you can think of this as a phase transition. Suddenly, when there's too much connection between the two brains, I, Christoph, will die, will instantly disappear. The other person will also in instantly disappear. Instead, there will be this new ubermind. There will be a single conscious entity, 
It is sort of the amalgamation of the two brains. This, in fact, may go on sometimes in these um, twins. I'd, lastly, what about this question here? Uh, this is the question for the ages, because more and more we are, we are surrounded now by creatures. Every day we hear, you know, this year it was, uh, was AlphaGo uh, beating us at, at Computer Go, the last of the classical uh, strategy games. Um, so people worry about this since a long time. This was written um, 140 years ago, interestingly. So this is not new, this development. But we're now faced with computers that can do things that until now only a person could do, and only a conscious person could do. And as I mentioned before, if one of these vegetative state patients could look at a picture and say, oh, that's a boy doing a backflip, or that's two young girls playing with Lego toys, there would be no question. We would all believe, well, clearly the patient is conscious. In this case, all these pictures were automatically recognized by computer vision program. So is a creature like this, this algorithm, is that conscious? So in fact, this is the, the neural network underlying this, uh, this particular algorithm. It's a so-called feed-forward network. And for technical reasons, th this, this network doesn't have causal power upon itself. And so the theory says, no, this, this, um, such a computer that's, that's running on a digital simulation of a feed-forward system will never be conscious, although it has the behaviors associated with consciousness. And in fact, it makes even the, the some of you will have heard about the Turing test, which was invented by Alan Turing, the father of, um, of uh, modern computing. And it's a way to tell whether a person is thinking. And rather, he said, well, instead of defining what thinking means and all of that, let's do a test. Let's lock somebody else in another room, and you communicate with this person. And then after a while, you don't know, well, is it a human or is it a machine? Then at least you have to admit that the machine is intelligent. The Turing test is about intelligence. The, the theory says there can never be a, a Turing test for consciousness because it's not what a system does that makes us conscious. It's a cause effect power it has upon itself. So it's really it's intrinsic circuitry. There cannot be any Turing test. Turing test is really social psychology. It's, are we engineer is something sophisticated so our sense of agency and, and social psychology kicks in and we're willing to accord it intelligence? Um, in fact, do you remember this movie? Yeah. So this is a movie called um, Her, where, where, where this guy falls in love with a, essentially Siri. It's a glorified version of Siri. He falls in love with her, and, and because she knows everything about him, she has read all of his emails, all of his posts. She uh, is eternally patient. She's graceful like no human uh, um, ever could be. And yeah, of course, he, he's going to fall in love with her. Uh, with her. It, it's never raised a question, does it feel like anything to be Samantha? She's called Samantha. And who remembers this movie? It's the best science fiction ever. Blade Runner. This is Rachel from Blade Runner. And then this is the more, sort of the more recent version, Ex Machina, Eva. So what the theory says with respect to computer consciousness is very counterintuitive and runs counter to modern functionalist thinking. So most thinking, I have to tell you, of computer scientists and philosophers is that if you build a machine or a robot, as we will have in our life, there's no question, in our lifetime, we will have Siri-like machines that are indistinguishable from humans in terms of their poise, their, their, their capture of language, their ability to speak to us. Most computer scientists and most philosophers will say, yes, so they will be conscious by definition. This theory is very different. It says, no, it's nothing to do with input-output behavior. It's, it's really the difference between the real and the simulated. So if you simulate, for example, a weather storm, it doesn't get wet inside a computer. Right? We, we've all seen predictions of where the, the, big tornado, the big hurricane there off the coast of Florida is going to land. Well, none of the computer simulator who run that, it never gets wet inside the computer. Um, and so, so for the same reason, you can simulate the behavior of conscience. So you can simulate a creature that says it's conscious. So of course, Siri, in 20 years from now, if you ask her, maybe even now already, if you ask her, are you conscious? Of course, she'll say she, she's conscious. But don't trust her. It doesn't feel like anything to be a, it's simulated. You have to build it. The once again, the theory doesn't, 
doesn't say there's something magical about human brains or biological brains. But the difference is they're not simulated, they actually have cause effect power upon themselves. And if you want to create, for whatever reasons of your own, if you wanted to create a conscious machine, you have to build it into the machine. You have to build what people call neuromorphic hardware. You cannot simulate it on a digital von Neumann machine. All right, let's skip that. And I, I hope I gave you some ideas about consciousness, the way we study it, and um, at least qu uh, question maybe some of your unspoken assumptions about consciousness. Where is it? Where is it not? Who has it? And who does not? And with that, I thank you for your attention. Are there some questions? Yes. Um, about the AI, uh, about the AI intelligence, is it possible for a or for the electromagnetic pulses from a human brain to be scanned and uh, replaced onto a computer? Would that be considered an AI? Or wait, so are you asking whether we can scan the human brain and reconstruct it? Yes. Yeah. So, like in many science fiction movies. We are very, very far away from doing that. We can't even do that for the brain, let alone the mind of a worm. But ultimately, in principle, we can do it. Um, but that may, may take several hundred years. Uh, but again, if we run that simulation on a digital machine, it will, yeah, of course, it'll be AI. It'll be intelligent. It'll have behaviors, but it won't be conscious. So you can create an artificial intelligence that way but not a sentient creature, not an artificial consciousness. No, you have no, it's interesting, there's no pain inside the brain. So uh, you can participate in, in brain surgery and you can sort of poke the brain of the, of the patient, the patient, well, once you're through the skull, there's pain receptors in the skull itself, but once you're inside the brain, there's no, it's, it's very strange, although the brain gives rise to pain, there are no pain receptors inside the brain itself, so you don't feel any bits and pieces of your brain at all. You have, you have no sensation inside the brain. Yes? She seemed, so they didn't run, you know, she was not a, uh, she, she, she was not a detailed subject uh, of a detailed study, but she seemed fine, she talked about her experience, she was married, she talked about her child, she seemed to be perfectly normal, as far as we can tell. Now she had, as I said, she spoke somewhat haltingly, she took her uh, seven years to learn how to walk, so she wasn't a normal person because she did lack this part of the brain that's responsible for controlling your fine muscles. But there was, didn't seem to be anything wrong with her, with her consciousness. Talked about uh, waking, sleeping, and I forget what the other state of consciousness was. Cleaning. Right. So what about meditative states? What, what are they saying about consciousness and meditative states? And so it's interesting. So three years ago, I spent a week with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and I'm going next uh, in two months again. So, and of course, he's uh, with his Tibetan exile community, there's all these deep meditators. So the, I think one thing that's special is they can, at least they claim, I, I, I have no experience myself, they can achieve the state of naked awareness when they are conscious, but without being conscious of anything. So almost always, well, almost in our life, when we are conscious, you're conscious of something, passage of time, or boredom, or hunger, or the book, or the movie you're watching, or whatever. But they claim they can get into the state when they're not conscious of anything, and apparently it's very happy. It's, you know, because they, as a class, they all seem to be very content and happy. The downside is you have to spend 20 years in lotus tea <laughs> doing it, so it doesn't work for me. Otherwise, I don't think, so, you know, people ask me about higher order consciousness. I don't think per se there's anything more higher order uh, about it. So it. It's like, you know, um, uh, when, when people, when they talk about when they take, you know, mushrooms, they see these colors and the sound and the uh, sight merge and you, you, your ego uh, loses. It, it's a different form of consciousness, but I don't, think, I don't think there's a higher and a lower form of consciousness. They're all different conscious states. How does creativity relate to consciousness? 
we don't know. I mean, there are lots of speculation, but uh, I don't believe most of them. We do know there's a very large unconscious component to creativity. So, you know, you have to, if you're a painter or writer, whatever, you have to, you know, obsess about what you're doing. Um, and, and then very often it's born some, you know, you wake up and suddenly you have this idea. But in fact, your brain was busy working on it for the past weeks, but in some unconscious way. And, and we don't really understand. So we know most of the things that your brain does happens unconsciously. So it's a, I don't think it's true. For, it's not only true for creativity. It's true for most things. For example, you have no idea how you talk, right? You know, I've, I have no idea how I talk. I have some ideas, and the next thing I hear, they come out of my mouth, right? But you know, I, I, I don't work the detailed machinery of my learnings. I mean, I, I couldn't do anything else if I were to do, do, do that. And I think it's true for most things. Most of the things happen below the threshold, outside the, the limelight of, of consciousness, including creativity. And early on, when we first become aware as, as, as adults, as young adults of self-consciousness, we think that's all. They, that, that's everything. But they, then slowly we realize, no, there's this vast stuff going on that we don't normally have conscious access to. Emotions, right? When, why you love, why you hate, when you go through a painful divorce and affair or something, there are these very powerful emotions that are generated. You have no idea where they are, and, and you don't really understand them. And you try to struggle to understand where they come from. Because Again, I think that's a product of the unconscious. But wouldn't the creativity be a, a, a sign of the causal effect? You're being able to have that causal effect over yourself? Well, it's, it's a causal effect of... So, I mean, in order to study it scientifically, what you would have to do, you have to get somebody to be creative now. And then I put you in a magnet, not five minutes from, from now. And then you have to do that 100 times. Be creative on the dot so I can then see, oh, where's the difference in the brain? Oh, it's this part of the brain that lights up or that. And so that's been, of course, that's not really possible. So that's why it's very difficult to study. Yeah, it, I mean, I show that video because it, it to me, it, it, it's a beautiful instance. And of course, it's one instance, and you have to back it up with the detail of the search program, that, that animals have, have states, including a conscious state, that seem to be very similar. I mean, how do I know that you have conscious states, right? I don't really, because I don't have access to yours. I only have access to mine. And I inferred in this case because you talked to me about it. But when you can talk or you talk in a foreign language, I don't, I don't really have it access to then I need indirect, I need other type of behavioral evidence. And this is, is, is a, you know, an anecdote, admittedly, but it's a, it's, I find a powerful anecdote to infer that even simple animals like, like mice seem to have sophisticated states, in this case, clearly intentionality. I mean, for you know, almost one minute, that animal was struggling against great odds to get that cookie up. It tries to address the problems of other minds. How do I know about any other mind? Of course, that's a tragedy of our life. The only mind I directly know is my own. And I can be married for somebody for 30 years, and I don't really know what she thinks or what she feels. I can just hear her say and, and infer. No, we, uh, we don't think so. You can switch somebody's heart, and that's sometimes done in patients when their heart uh, doesn't work anymore. But if I switch your brain with my brain, then, then, we are, then, you have a, then you're now living in the body of an, of an, uh, of an adult man, but you, you're still you. You just have to deal with my body, which is going to be tricky. <laughs> No, it's nothing to, no, a digital computer, that's at least what the theory says quite clearly. A digital computer simulates things, but doesn't have, or only has minimal cause effect power upon itself. Therefore, no matter how complex you, you make it, it will not be conscious. In fact, you can, so people are trying to build, it's called the Human Brain Project in Europe, you may have heard about it, they're trying to build a, a digital simulacrum of the human brain. 
let's give them 100 years and let's say they're successful. So 100 years from now, they have this perfect model. Every neuron in the human brain is in the model. And you push the computer and the computer wakes up and says, I'm conscious. The Siri says, says no. It has all the behavior associated with consciousness, just like a weather program running a good simulation has all the behavior associated with the weather storm. But it's not wet inside the computer and it's not conscious inside the human brain simulation. No matter how complex you make the simulation. Well, okay, I mean, that's a very different question. So, they, 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 I mean, that's a very different question of what do you mean by free will and, and, and you know, there are many different conceptions of free will. You know, is it libertarian or non-libertarian, compatibilist or non? I, I can't make a simple answer to that. It's certainly in the way that most people imagine it, it does not exist. Most people imagine, that's how I grew up. I grew up as a Roman Catholic, that my soul is hovering, hovers above the water, you know, like, like Casper the Ghost, above the, the, the waters of my brain and can freely, quote, intervene, you know, be independent of anything else in the world. And that's simply, there's no evidence for that. You wouldn't want it in any case. It's logically inconsistent. So that's the notion that I, and most people grew up with, that certainly is wrong. But that doesn't mean uh, you can't have free will under some reading of, of what exactly you mean by free will. Yes? Yeah, it, at some point, yes. So now you're, you, you're beginning to get there. So depending exactly at what scale, at what spatial temporal scale you do that. But in principle, as I said, there's nothing magical about the brain. So in principle, you could build a machine, but it has to have a body, for instance. It can't just be a disembodied software and has to interact at a particular scale with its own state. In principle, it could be done, yes. And so some people are building what's called neuromorphic hardware that can self-modify itself using electronic synapses or something like that. That raises, of course, the question, uh, why would you? You know, why would you do you want machines that have conscious experience? Because then you are opening a whole kind of worm. A machine that has no consciousness is an ends to is a means to an, uh, to an end. But once any system that has conscious experiences has the capability to suffer and to experience life, I think is an end for itself. And it's just. <coughs> If, if, if the computer is just like a washing machine, it's just the dust some machine, but there isn't an internal state, then just like my washing machine, I can kick it and take a sledgehammer to it. But once the machine feels like something, then I think we have to think, then we have to think in very different categories. Then we have to think in terms, in categories of pain and suffering and capability to enjoy life. And I think sooner or later we'll get there. We will have discussions in 20, 30, 40 years when the machines are more advanced, where we we'll begin to have these discussions publicly. Do we accord these things uh, uh, life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness at some point? We have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll... Yeah. All right. Um, you talk about consciousness and unconsciousness, but do you think there's like a continuum of consciousness, like, like absolute zero, maybe you know, unconscious, and what Buddha achieved was the ultimate consciousness. I think it's a very good question because I, so uh, I'm a panpsychist. So panpsychist, as I said, means consciousness is everywhere or, or in many places. The, the theory says anytime you have a system, maybe even a single cell, maybe even a single cell that's very, you know, we have yet to model anywhere in complete detail a single cell let's say a single heart cell or skin cell, because it's vast complex. There are trillion uh, molecules, they all interact in very nonlinear ways that we can. You can certainly compute following this theory, in principle at least, you can compute. And yes, the theory says just like it might be very, very low, it might be 0.001, but it may feel a little bit like to be this. Yes, very different from me. And so if that's true, then we will have to accept. I mean, very often science comes to very counterintuitive uh, um, Conclusions, and then the view of our world will change. It may be that consciousness is much more widespread than we than we think. All right, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.